There was never a point, I don't think, where I smiled throughout that period, and it, it wasn't because I didn't want to. It's quite possible for anyone, whatever your background, wherever you've been, whatever your story, that you can come out of this. Being able to speak to someone and talk to someone about it released that pressure and automatically I felt stronger because I didn't have this burden anymore. Life now is bloody marvellous, absolutely marvellous. There was a time in Matt Connolly's life when walking up Holcomb Hill would have been impossible. It was not Everest or you know Kilimanjaro, but it's something that I didn't think I would ever do again. Matt was going through depression. I didn't have any meaning in my life. I didn't have anything to get up for in the morning. Even fairly simple things are much harder to do when you're depressed. Kathy Weald thought she would never decorate again. I thought I'd never do anything again. I'm. I just lay there hoping life would end. And Anthony Moore felt the same. I fell into a, um, almost a wallowing um, self-pity. Um, thought there would be never any way out of it. Matt, Kathy and Anthony are not alone in having these feelings. There was a survey done in England about six years ago. The results were that about a quarter of women claimed to have had suicidal thoughts at some time during their lives, and for men the figure was 13%. Consultant psychiatrist Alice Cole King supports people struggling to cope. She's learned about why people feel this way. They tend to be things like the breakup of a relationship or the loss of support, physical illness, financial worries, appearing in court, often the death of a loved one. All these are the type of events that any one of us could have. And anyone can have suicidal thoughts. Holcomb Hill is no longer an impossible challenge for Matt. Today, he's climbing the hill in the Pennines near where he lives. It's a sign of recovery from the major depression he went through in his early 20s. He looks back to those troubled times. I didn't know how to cope with my anxieties, you know, in social situations, how I'm supposed to conduct myself in society. As soon as I would wake up in the morning, I would be almost shaking, um, and it was like my heart was in, in my throat constantly because I was so tense and so uptight. He found his job in a Manchester clothes shop unfulfilling. He had neither hobbies nor interests. I couldn't find anything to stimulate me. There was no differentiation between anything. So, say people get excited about, say, cars, or um, if people get excited about, you know, architecture or anything like that, those things weren't differentiated for me. So, therefore, there was no point at which I could get stimulated by anything. So, I, I was very down. Like many people in his situation, Matt turned to drink and drugs, mostly ecstasy. What the drugs do is they completely take away the thing you don't want in life, which for me was anxiety. I became the person I wanted to be. I would just spend money like there was no tomorrow, money that I didn't have. I, I, I would go out on 48-hour drinking sessions and drug sessions but drink and drugs didn't help. They give you extremely large highs. They give you also extremely low times. It went worse when I hit the, hit the drugs and the alcohol because as much as I, I didn't want to admit it, they did have an impact biologically on me. And, um, from what was already a mixed up and confused mind was ju just became a, a cocktail, you know, of um, mixed emotions, drugs, alcohol, and um, 
and it, it, it was just building and it was just ready, ready to burst early. Kathy Weald also looks back to the days when she experienced severe depression. I thought I was just destined to be some kind of a vegetable that sat there and moped. In the early 90s, she was working long hours in the health service and began to feel overwhelmed. They thought it might be my work because I was working such long hours and not seeing my children very much, which was distressing. No one really found a reason, although they suggested that I was vulnerable because of my childhood, where I was sent off to school when I was very young and I really, really missed my parents. Her depression spanned two decades and grew so severe that she attempted to take her own life. People in deep emotional pain, they're just thinking, how can I get this pain to stop? And they're not able to think about possible solutions to the situation because the pain is so great. Many researchers use the term entrapment, that you're actually caught up in a trap, uh, you feel humiliated and defeated, and you don't see any solution. Mental illness or major shocks can cause suicidal behaviour. Steve and Alice have long experience studying the subject and helping people recover. They believe there is hope, even for those in the most extreme distress. If you know where to get help, if you know how to get help, you can be helped through it. And nobody, no matter how desperate they feel, is ever beyond accepting help from somebody. But before that, there are often obstacles to overcome. There's a lot of stigma surrounding mental illness, which de 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 depression is. Um, and often myself, I've been, I've been caught up in these sort of discussions whereby people are, are called a weirdo or, or um, you know, abnormal or, or whatever. So I didn't want to be, to be branded the same, the same thing. I didn't want to be tarnished with the same brush. Um, so I just, I just kept it bottled up. Blaming yourself doesn't help either. I was actually obsessed with the fact it was my fault and I really thought I was to blame. And I used to tell everyone that it was my fault and um, that I only had my just desserts, as it were. Many people find it hard to accept help, but there is one category who find it particularly difficult. Men in their 40s or 50s, I think they've coped for so long, they think they can carry on coping and they don't. We all think that we are invincible, should handle everything, um, should have the answer for everything. Part of the issue there, I think, especially among men and men's greater risk, is of suicide is explained by their lesser ability to recognise when they have mental health problems and to seek help. Men are just over three times more likely to complete suicide than women. The years from your mid-30s to mid-50s are the years with the highest suicide rates. Life fell apart for Anthony Murr in his 40s when his marriage broke up. He was left to cope with the challenges of single parenthood and a demanding job. It, it was like having a map and not knowing where to go. There was, like, decisions to be made, there was routes to take, and I, got, I didn't have a clue where to go with it all. It was just like running around and running circles with, with nothing to do or not knowing what to do. I felt very, very lonely. There was no, nobody to share anything with. I'd be working till one or two o'clock in the morning. Sleep didn't come easy. So all I did was start off drinking a bottle of wine, watching MTV, one bottle of wine, two bottle of wine, and then the one night I was sat there, I thought, this has got to stop. This has got to stop. Matt, too, reached that critical point one day when he was at work. I was serving somebody at the time. I, I, I sold suits. I thought... 
I don't want to do this anymore, basically. I want to try and find why I want to live and I want to be on, on this earth. So I just put, I, I put everything down and it, it didn't, it, it became irrelevant to me. I just, I just walked out. I would urge anybody who feels like this to say to yourself, if I can just get through the next few minutes, if I can just get help and get through the next few minutes, the next few hours, I know I'll get through it. But can such crisis be prevented earlier? Here in Cornwall, that's what they're hoping to do. At the Zeb Centre for Young People in Truro, youth worker Shauna Harrison is giving a talk on emotional resilience. And whenever people look at me thinking, what is emotional resilience? Hopefully by the end of this hour, you will know. Shauna is delivering a training programme called Connecting with People. Can anybody think what a st stressful life event might be? Death. Death, yeah. Anything else? Going to the doctors could be stressful. Yeah, that's what resilience is about, really. It's about different people cope with things in different ways. And it's about... She tours schools and youth groups throughout the county. Her key message, if you are sinking, seek help early. In this circle, where would it be easier to ask for support? In the stream. Why? Because it's not very deep. It's not very deep in the stream? And that's where you're starting to get distressed, not when you're all the way beyond the point of thinking, I can't do anything now, I'm too stressed. So that's where you're starting to get stressed. It's easier to get across, possibly, with the stepping stones. Is it easy to reach in and pull you out? Yeah? What about in the ocean? You're buggered. Yeah. <laughs> Why? What's happening? What's happening in the ocean? When then you're too lost. You're too lost when you're out in the ocean? We can possibly get you. Yeah? The group at Zebs offers young people a whole range of social activities as well as emotional support. Many people wanted me to feel more happy so I had a talk with a few people from this group and they thought it was a good idea. It's just kind of somewhere that I can come chill out with friends, meet new people that have been in similar situations to me. I felt I needed to get somewhere, go somewhere where I um, could really connect with other people who were just like me and they shared my own feelings. Perhaps maybe they could give me some more confidence. And you understand each other more because you've all been through it. You can give each other bits of advice that maybe they didn't know and like share different um, tactics that can help you. I'm a lot more confident than I was, say, two years ago. During the course, young people are encouraged to identify feelings which upset them and learn about practical ways of coping, like eating well, sleeping well, taking exercise and making room for fun in their lives. There's always just something positive to do and it's kind of like, I sometimes see it as like a pick-me-up when you're feeling quite low, it's just something to kind of, you know, get boosted up again. There's definitely um, a need for more services like this because it can help so many people and it, well, it, it can save lives It because it, it makes you feel that you're not the only one. To save her life, Cathy Weald sought help from the medical profession. The really significant step was realising that she wasn't to blame. I'm so grateful to the doctors and nursing staff who actually didn't reinforce my own views that actually it was my fault. They would come and say, you know, Cathy, this is not your fault. You're ill, you're unwell, but one day you'll be better again. And slowly it dawned on me that this was the truth. I knew then that this was an illness that needed treatment and therefore I could get better. People going to war want to come back, even though they've been fighting in all awful states. In some respects, it's the same. You've been in a war. It's good to come back. Recovery was long, slow and uneven. It wasn't just my doing. It was with the help of doctors and nurses and psychotherapists, counsellors. 
that they brought me out of it. At times you don't seem like you are improving, but you definitely are. Kathy made a conscious effort to lift herself with household tasks, cooking and decorating. I think small improvements are, are what you need to encourage yourself to actually see that you're different than you were a few weeks ago. She now enjoys a stable, contented life. She reflects on what would have happened if her life had ended. I would have missed out on seeing my new grandchildren. Well, they were born three years ago. And many other pleasures and satisfactions, including the new coat of paint on her front room wall. It's just as well I'm not a perfectionist. I'm still affected by everyday lows and highs as anyone is. But I know that if I feel a bit down that it's not going to last. It's something which will go away. And I'm not embarrassed about what has happened to me in the past. Anthony also came back from the brink. He rang the Samaritans. I'd ring the number and put the phone down because I thought, well, what are they going to do? You know, do they care? And then the one day he picked it up quicker than I was expecting. And the start of the conversation was very, very difficult. Um, and once I got going, it, it was just like, it was like pulling the plug out of the bath. Um, you know, if, if the water's all your problems, I pull the plug out and off it went. When somebody calls a helpline, I think the key for them to know, they will not judge you. Anything you say will be in confidence and they will be there to listen. They will let you know that you do matter, that you matter very much. We can never tell somebody their reasons for living, but what we can do is support someone into finding their own reasons for living. It was a process Anthony found enormously helpful. I'd verbalised all my problems. Rather than having it going round inside, I'd, I'd got them on in, into the open, you know, so it was like putting them on the table, if you like, thinking that, that, and that, and then I'll, what am I going to do with them now? He dealt with one of life's fundamental issues. I didn't look after money. Money, money just went out the window, and the one of the first things I had to do was budget. I had to sit down and sort out what had to be paid, how much I could pay, and then carry on from there. Life got better. I've um, obviously moved on. I um, got remarried in 2002. Um, met a fantastic woman um, who. I never thought I'd meet. At one point, I didn't think there was any hope. And there was. And what of Matt? After walking out of his workplace, he wandered in a daze through Manchester city centre. And then he had a lucky break. If I hadn't have found Samaritans that day, it, I literally did stumble across it. I was walking down Oxford Road and I noticed it there, and I thought, you know what, give it a chance. I was desperate, really. I wanted somebody to talk to or something to do, other than drugs, that would, would, would help me. I was restricting myself from going into the Samaritans because I was thinking, oh, I'm going to be a weirdo. Well, I did go in, and from there, the service that Samaritans provided the confidentiality, the ability to say exactly what was on my mind without any repercussions, essentially it cha changed my life. Without that first step, the consequences could have been fatal. I honestly believe that I would have gone home and I don't know how I would have done it, but I would have ended my life that day. Matt's recovery began when he realised that he had to stop trying to conform to other people's expectations. He had to find his own path instead. I had to think about myself, um, because what caused it was thinking about other people constantly all the time and how other people wanted me to react. 
Ironically, that involved getting a job helping out at a home for dementia patients and volunteering as a Samaritan. He also took up a college course. The lifestyle suited him better. Yeah, I don't believe in, in altruism. I think there is, we all do things to get something out for ourselves as well. And yeah, I, I, I find I can sleep a lot better at night when I've known that I've made a little bit of difference to somebody else's life. I was walking up Hogan Hill to be on top of Hogan Hill and looking out on what I thought I would never see again is, is a massive achievement for me. When people lose hope, it's almost as if they have to borrow others' hope. Talking to people for me was one of the biggest helps on my road to recovery. If you get through feeling so absolutely awful, it becomes such an absolute delight when those feelings lift. Life now is bloody marvellous. Absolutely marvellous. If you need help, you can go to these websites. You can also ring Samaritans on these numbers.